so I hope I hope you enjoyed the panel. Um, I'm really grateful. We always get such a great group of people to come. Uh, but I want to open this time up for you guys to ask your questions. And I explained to them that you, you know, watched most of the videos now. So, um, and then I know Dr. Svekovic said she brought a couple uh, patient cases that she could talk about if nobody has any burning questions. Um, so, uh, but why don't we start with questions? Does anybody have any questions following the panel today? Um, so one thing that I was thinking with all of these charting methods um, is that when you're growing up and like you first learn about having your period and like what that means, sometimes it can come and surprise you. And you know, when, maybe when you're not like doing any of the birth control, you don't you don't know when to expect it. So why aren't um, teenage girls taught this method kind of as a way to know like what to expect and how can we incorporate that in our health education when we're younger and what are your thoughts on that? Well there are some instances in which there are taught there's a program called Teen Star which is actually an absence, absence program but the girls are taught to chart very basically and in fact Dr. Uh, Sister Hannah Klaus is right over here in uh, Bethesda and she um, She's gone all over the world teaching this, and she found out what uh, Dr. Duane said is that many did decrease their sexual activity, mm -hmm. and those who were committed to it remain committed. Um, the second thing is that there are some girls who started doing this when they were 12 or 13, and they actually predicted their first period. Mm -hmm. oh. Pretty awesome. Wow. Yeah, I remember when I did my Creighton training, my yeah, Creighton same. teacher said, like, because, you know, when you talk about this, you teach this, you know, your yeah. kids pick up on it. And her daughter was like, when can I check my cervical mucus? And she was like, and her mother's like, you don't have any. She's like, but I want to check. And so her mother, like, taught her, like, well, when you wipe, you know, she'd explain, like, the basics about it. And so she did. And then one day she noticed the mucus and she predicted her first period before it. Was like, I'm good. <laughs> she was very excited. So, so but, but, why, yeah, but why is it not taught very? But why is it not being taught to teenagers? Mm -hmm. um, like in their health sex class. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, it absolutely should. I think there's the fear of you're going to, and this is, I know Dr. Klaus has run into this with teen star. Like, well, then they're going to know when they can have sex. And so they're going to have sex more often. But it's like, but we're going to put them on birth control pills and then they're not going to have sex. I mean, so it's just. It's this schizophrenic society we live in. Like, we don't want to tell them about it because then they might have sex, but we'll put them on birth control just in case they're going to have sex. It's like, six one half dozen the other. But, um, but a lot of organizations, I mean, a lot of groups are afraid of, you know, this is going to encourage sexual activity, which is why Dr. Klaus has done the studies to show, no, it's the exact opposite. The other thing is it takes time. I am trained as a Teen Star educator, and the way the curriculum in Teen Star is designed is there's a curriculum for girls, and there's a curriculum for boys, because they believe, like, you need to teach boys about their changing body and about their fertility and about their hormones just as much as you need to teach the girls. Um, and so when I was uh, the medical director at the community health center here locally, I had a male physician who was also a Teen Star educator, and he did a boys' curriculum. Well, the boys' curriculum is designed to meet once a month, you know, 10 times, 10 or 12 times over the course of a year, so you could do it, like, twice a month over a six-month period. The girls' curriculum, because you do need to go into much more detail, is designed to meet 20 times throughout the course of a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, most health education classes have, like, two sessions at most on sex and sexuality, and they have to cover everything, so there's not the time. For those of you that are learning to chart, you, you realize, like, there there's some time involved. So it's a matter of, like, what do we prioritize? But okay. I'm a firm believer we absolutely should be teaching girls this from the time they're 10, 11, 12, from that empowering perspective. Because of what you said, you know, when you know when to predict your period mm -hmm. so that you're not surprised, like, oh, I'm a vacation in Disney World, and, like, oh, I'm not surprised. Like, I know, Monday morning, like, I know what to expect. And all of a sudden, it's like you're not caught off guard and you can prepare when you're going to travel. And, you know, you don't want to be that girl who's, like, you know, on the tennis team and, you know, you're all wearing white. And, oh, my God, I can't play in the match today. And so, very empowering. Then it may even be an, an even... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> an even more profound sort of place we are of ignorance overall because it may not be that there's a deliberate attempt not to incorporate this education into, uh -huh. you know, um, preteen sex ed uh, sessions, the two that exist. It may just be that people don't even know that it's mm -hmm. something useful to, 
to talk about in addition to what the most obvious sign, which was, which is bleeding. So we know about the bleeding. We don't know about the things happening between the bleeding episodes. But I think if we had more general knowledge about why that's useful, well, then there would be more people trying to come up with, you know, maybe shorter, more um, feasible programs to integrate into to earlier education. But right now, there's just profound ignorance about it. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's true. I have a comment, and it's just a simple one. I think in the teaching of young girls, we need to tell them that every month they have a red flow, and they have a white flow, and that it's normal. We just, they just don't know anything about the white flow. So the level of detail that you go into can be, you know, vary based on a program. But if they don't know this, they sometimes conclude that they have an infection or that something is wrong with my body because something is coming out of my body and I don't know what it is. Just as you might consider yourself sick if you had your period and you didn't know what it was. So I really think just simplicity is the best thing. A red flow and a white flow. You know, that's how they used to teach it in South America 30 years ago. The buildings with them? There's a priest that I, I heard speak and that's how they taught it. White period and a red period. And, and white can be invisible. And if you're, you know, it's, we all have different levels of body awareness. There are some people who are very body aware, and there's some of us who are just completely in a hurry. And by the time you figure out there's something going on, it's gone away, so you don't worry about it anymore. So white can be clear, can be invisible, can be not too much some months, not, but just to know red and white, red and white. So I think when you say that to mothers, it's empowering because they've lived their whole lives like this and nobody ever taught them this either. So. I would like to add too with teaching kids, I think it's interesting, it would, or teaching at the beginning, right? And that the, a lot of people want to go on birth control for a regular period, that my cycle isn't regular. And when you're first starting out, it might not be regular, but also seeing that there could be a pattern there that you just didn't wait to notice, right? That they're like, oh, for two months it was irregular, didn't come at 28 days or whatever. But maybe it's a pattern of three months or four months. You know, they don't really realize anything until, you know, a year out. But then realize, then once you notice the pattern, how long it can kind of empower you throughout your teens into your 20s and whatever. So, I mean, it took me, I think, about seven months to figure out the, where my pattern was. Um, that's, that's sometimes a long time for people. And it's especially important in teenagers because, and I, I think I've mentioned this, in the first two years after a young girl starts menstruating, it's normal for her cycle to vary anywhere from 21 to 45 days. And we see a lot of these girls being put on the pill because they've got irregular cycles to regulate them. And what we're doing is we're suppressing their normal hormonal access so that their body isn't learning how to regulate itself, you know, without the artificial chemicals. So, Other questions? <coughs> I had a question. Um, you mentioned that you're in the military. Yes. Well, first, thank you for your service. Oh, yes. um, but also, I was wondering, how much room do you have if you did want it to stop prescribing birth control? Is that something you are able to do in the military, or how does that work? That's an excellent question. <laughs> I've never, you know, having, what's this? What's your, you find it? I'll find out. <laughs> well, I'm actually retiring June 1st, so <laughs> I won't find out. I've done, we're, um, so I'm transitioning mm -hmm. as, a, as a civilian provider. Um, I have never worked with, you know, a provider in, in the many places I've worked in the military that didn't prescribe, so I don't know. I, I like to think that, you know, I don't think, I think it would be fine. You know, if I had the courage to say a year ago, you know, I think they would be shocked, like, okay, wait, you've been doing this forever, and all of a sudden you're just going to, you know, there might have been a shock factor, but I wouldn't have lost my job. I can't get fired. <laughs> and the military, so they, they, there's so many other things that I was an asset to in my career than just prescribing contraception. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think had I really just gone and said, no, I'll still inform women of all their choices, but if they if they you don't want them, they just need to make an appointment with my colleague who will and essentially so since there's so I think I think it would have been fine, but mm -hmm. I didn't take I didn't I, think I didn't find out. I didn't find out. I um, have something. examples from about birth control in the military, but I do have people I've known in the military who the military has been much more forgiving or tolerant, if you will, about their stance in not providing abortions. And I think they also have, there's been a few cases maybe having to do with NFP as I'll well. I'll talk to you about that. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I think if you have an asset 
to offer yeah. um, that makes you marketable anywhere you go and nobody else offers it. You're actually a treasure for that organization because everybody else is doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. So anybody who decides to stop prescribing, like I did, um, I mean, I had a crisis of conscience for probably five years before I even decided to deprive, as I thought, deprive mm -hmm. my patients of contraceptives after I had been prescribing for so long. Um, and soon enough, I figured out I was feeling uncomfortable enough with myself not offering something good for them and having this dichotomy in the, in the conversations that <coughs> would make time management impossible. So um, I think anybody in any situation that decides to stop prescribing and says, I, don't, I, I decide from this thing on to not prescribe, but I have this to offer, which nobody else is offering, will not be kicked out of a job because of that. Because you'll open a new market of services to a sector of wherever you work, military or, or in traditional um, job or in a hospital. So just, just what I tell people is to follow the conscience. You have to live with yourself. If, you're, if you know you're doing something that can hurt people, but you have something that can't hurt anybody no matter how hard you try, you have to make that choice. And, Take your stake. Just, just to follow up on that, did you see a change in the, your numbers of clients when you moved from a practice that provided artificial birth control to, to what you're doing now? Which is the opposite. Totally natural. Well, I had no idea what was going to happen. I was like, well, who's going to go to an OBGYN? Does anybody not prescribe birth control? Like, what kind of OBGYN doesn't prescribe birth control? So I really wasn't sure what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And some people, some patients were angry and they left. Um, and then so this was like in 2009, like I said, and then 2013, St. Agnes Hospital called me and said, hey, we heard that you do natural family planning. Do you want to start an OB practice here? Um, and within two years, I became the busiest OB practice in the whole hospital. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, same thing happened. Mm -hmm. I want to speak to the military issue specifically because the very first year I taught this selective, one of my medical students was going through medical school in the Army. Mm -hmm. And so I had to do a military residency. Uh, and she went on to do a, a residency in family medicine. So it, be, it, was an, it was a real issue. And what I see, unfortunately, happen is a lot of times I'll have medical students that are very interested in this or that decide they want to stop prescribing and so choose to go into radiology or pathology mm -hmm. or some specialty where it's not going to become an issue, you know, because they don't. There's, there's a real fear there. I mean, you're investing all of this time. They're paying for your education. I mean, I think it's different when you're, uh, when you're not in training, when you're active, um, as opposed to like when you're a student or a resident, they, to a certain degree, they own you more. Um, and there's, I think there is real fear of loss of training opportunities, um, loss of job opportunities, not getting to do, I mean, they may say like, well, you can't do an OB guy in residency. You can go do, um, you know, sports medicine or whatever. Um, so, but that first student, um, the first year that I taught, she called me when she was an intern. So five years later, oh. and she found out, like, she was scheduled for her OB rotation next month, and she found out every Wednesday was IUD clinic. She's like, what am I going to do to have to train? Like, I, I can't put IUDs in women. And, and she was understandably panicked, like, very concerned. She, you know, she didn't want to be labeled as, like, the bad resident, the, the difficult yeah. resident, the... You know, the resident's going to refuse. Shrieking your duty. And yeah, and what I explained to her is I said, you have rights. I mean, you have rights as a human being, as an individual. You've got conscience protection rights. I put her in touch with an attorney um, that wow. helps protect and helps defend um, uh, health care professionals to practice in accordance with their conscience. Um, she did not end up having to place IUDs. I mean, she said, I saw more women, like she saw more menopausal women. You know, they ended up giving her all of the non-IUD patients. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was a very good learning experience for her because she actually got to see much more of a variety mm -hmm. um, of women's health issues as opposed to just, you know, doing mm -hmm. IUDs. Um, so, so if you are military, and if you're not military, you know, and you choose or you think, I don't want to prescribe, I'm not going to sit here and say it's going to be easy. I went through residency prescribing. I didn't hear about fertility awareness until I was a resident, so it wasn't even an issue for me. There are residency programs that will accept residents, both in family medicine and in OB. You know, one of the things that BACS is doing is trying to survey all family medicine residency programs and then all OB residency programs to find out which residency programs will be more um, 
tolerant or friendly. Um, so, um, but in the military, it's challenging. Um, and and might want to speak to it or not. Um, uh, but she, you know, there there are people like Anne that I can put you in touch with that have uh, experience and other residents that have gone through this that we can connect you with if it becomes an issue. The bottom line is you should all know that beyond this selective, part of why we formed FACTS is to be a resource and a support system um, to help you, you know, as you learn more about these methods and seek to integrate them into your practice, whether you choose to offer birth control or not. I mean, I've got people that are very active who put IUDs in and do tubules and you know, but they're like, how do I start talking about these methods with patients? I want to be able to support you, and I want our organization to be able to support you. So, you. great question. Other questions? This is more like a hypothetical situation, I guess, any of you can answer, but um, the physician on the end put um, her case where she had the patient come in and say they wanted to be on birth control because they wanted to engage in sexual activity and kind of discourage it, and the mother was okay with it. <coughs> but, um, like, if the, pa the patient ended up engaging in sexual activity and did become pregnant, um, how do you deal with the patient and the mother maybe coming back to you and saying, like, this wouldn't have happened if you just put them on birth control? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, so I had a patient recently who came to me and she had her 10th abortion. And um, she's been my long-term patient and clearly she's using abortions as her form of contraception. Um, but she'd been on contraception in the past and was still had all of those abortions. So anyway, my, so the way that I think about it is at this point, it just sort of becomes like a, my own spiritual personal philosophy, which is that ultimately, I ultimately believe that it is not good for them. And that, so, and that if this is what happens as a consequence, um, Helping them to continue on a self-destructive road is still not good for them. So, okay, so a 15-year-old came in, was having her second baby, and the resident said, we need to put an IUD in as soon as her placenta comes in, right? And so, you know, you're like, well, this is not the underlying problem. The underlying problem isn't that she doesn't have an IUD, right? This is not why she's here a second time with a baby. But certainly it is a struggle to think, well, if she comes in with a third baby, you know, should I have just put that IUD in? But ultimately, the way I think about it is no, because I don't want her to continue doing what she's looking for love in all the wrong places and continuing on this path of, like, very self-destructive behavior. I'm still not going to enable it, no matter kind of, no matter what happens. You know, and at 15, she's probably being abused. I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, she's 15. If her boyfriend but even is, not 15, you know, I mean, even older, exactly. what, you know, but and are you, you have these unwanted pregnancies or women that say, well, yeah. maybe if I'd been on birth control, I wouldn't have had this abortion. Well, my patient didn't even say that. She had been on abortion. I mean, she had, been, you know, I mean, yeah. that's also the funny thing about contraception and abortion, artificial contraception and abortion. It doesn't actually turn out medically that as the incidence of artificial contraception has risen, the incidence of abortion in the United States has not gone down. Neither has the incidence of unintended pregnancy in the United States gone down. That's what the huge paradox is, right? You would think, well, we just need more and more and better and better contraception. But again, the incidence of unintended pregnancy in the United States is about 51%. That's been like that for a very long time and has actually risen. And the incidence of abortions, you know, goes up and down, but still hovers around a million. So despite all of this contraception, it's not really going down. And in fact, more... The, the Guttmacher Institute, which is the research arm for Planned Parenthood, they've done research that shows that more abortions are done on women who are using birth control at the time that they got pregnant. So over 50, it's like 54 percent of women got pregnant on contraception and then had an abortion. So it gets to the point that there is no method of birth control that's 100 percent effective. So to and and I think we we convince women that birth control is effective, even IUDs. I mean, I had a baby that I delivered with an IUD, like, implanted in the side of its head. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's, it's, that's the reality. I mean, the likelihood of getting pregnant with an IUD, yes, is significantly lower, um, you know, than if you're just not using anything. Um, but there's still the risk. And if you think you're safe, I mean, if you think I'm 100% safe, like, I know, like, when I drive, if I'm driving out west and, like, it's a straight highway and there's no cops, 
you better believe I'm going 100 miles an hour, <laughs> you know? But when I'm driving through the steep streets of D.C. and there's a speed camera on every single block, you know, I know I'm at much higher risk of getting a ticket. When, whereas when you perceive, like, there's this perceived risk-free opportunity, you engage in more risky behaviors. And so you have people that are having sexual relations because they think they're protected who might not otherwise do that if they thought there was a risk of getting pregnant. Does that make sense? It's called risk compensation. I think one of the best things yeah. we can see in, in, um, in the medical literature is looking at HIV AIDS in Uganda. Yeah. Right? And so their incidence of HIV AIDS in that population between 15 and 45 years old was like almost like 12% or something like that. And all of this use condoms kind of thing, it wasn't budging the HIV AIDS um, incidents in that country until the until the government, as a public health initiative, started this program called ABCs, the first one being abstinence and the second one being be faithful. And it was everywhere. And you see the signs that they had, like, being a virgin is good. Be, you know what I mean? Like, and it, was, and it wasn't any kind of moral message. It was a public health. Our HIV AIDS rate in this country is the worst in the world. And it wasn't until they did that and made condoms the last choice that their incidence of HIV AIDS dropped to less than 5%. It was this huge success. And so the only, the only country. Right, and it's remarkable, right? So because you have this thing of risk compensation where you're like, well, if I can use a condom, I will engage in this risky behavior. When really, you just want to not be in that risky behavior. You know, you don't want to drink and drive. You don't want to just say, well, I'm going to put on a seatbelt, right, and drink and drive. You want to not drink and drive. And so, you know, I think that's also a part of, um, uh, that's also a part of uh, uh, um, encouraging chastity or like real responsible sexual behavior. We're like, is it really okay if you get pregnant? Like, you know, is this okay? Because ultimately family planning requires um, some maturity and some motivation and some discipline, whatever it is, even if it's a condom, it requires those things and teenagers we're working on that, <laughs> but they're not there yet. A lot of adults aren't there yet, but you just have to keep in your mind that it requires those things, and just to hand out birth control pills to everybody obviously hasn't worked. It's never been worked. Just, just off that, would you feel the same way if the, the patient was going to engage in the activity no matter what? Like if you knew that they were still going to do it, even if they knew they were at more risk? <coughs> Like, would you have the same opinion yes. on prescribing the birth control? Yeah, because I still ultimately think it's not good for her. And she can get it from someone else, right. it, but it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. you. Medical professionals deserve to have a conscience mm -hmm. as well. You are not a store clerk who has to sell anything that the patient wants. Mm -hmm. You have to think about what is the best medicine. Mm -hmm. And I didn't come to that, like, I still think it's bad for her, like, very easily. No, right. It's kind of like, yeah, it was kind of like initially when I stopped, I'm like, I am so, so, so sorry I'm not giving you birth control anymore. You know, and it was really under, after having stopped it and seeing kind of what I, all the good that I thought was doing wasn't really that good, that it's just now over time been something that I feel very certain about. I mean, I, I would say I would still do the same thing, but it's it, it's more so because I know when I'm giving a woman birth control, I'm giving a healthy person a drug that has serious side effects, you know? And so I think I would feel far worse. I mean, I remember having a patient who was 24 years old who came in for a refill of her birth control. That was, that was what she was there for. And at that point, I was still prescribing. So she was scheduled to see me, and I did her physical. She was a little bit overweight, but, you know, like 27 BMI. It wasn't horrible. But her blood pressure was 180 over 90. I'm like, huh. So I rechecked it because I'm like, oh, they, you know, they may probably, you know, and I got like the same thing. And, and I went through her whole history. And the only thing that changed was the birth control pill. I'm like, I can't in good conscience refill this medication for you because I think this may be causing your elevated blood pressure. And for her, fortunately, it didn't have any significant side effects. But the birth control, the, the side effects of hormonal birth control are real. They're often underestimated or not talked about or, you know, glossed over, um, but they are real. I mean, to the point that, you know, studies show 65% of women stop using birth control within the first year because of the side effects. 
you know, whether it's like minors and not that any side effect is minor, but like whether it's a mild side effect, like mood changes or weight gain versus more serious side effects like blood clots and stroke um, or increased risk of cancer. I mean, there, there are real side effects. So I can't in good conscience give a healthy person a drug that I know is going to put them at risk for other issues. So, and you know, you might think like, well, they're still going to do it anyway, but it gets back to the, am I going to enable them? You know, am I going to allow, like as a parent, am I going to let the teenage kids sit at my, my house and drink alcohol because I'd rather them do it safely in my home? Then, no, I'm going to tell them you shouldn't be drinking at 15 years old. I'm not going to enable them by saying, well, I want to make it safer because then by doing that, you're saying, I'm giving you permission that somehow that this is okay. Whereas if somebody is like, no, this is not okay. This is not good for you and not good for your health. It's amazing. Those patients will come back to you after. I mean, I had patients when I transitioned over to start prescribing, I thought I was going to lose all of them. And I had a lot of them that went to my colleagues for their birth control, but they still came back to me for that reason. Like, I know you care. Like you're willing to say no. And it was, it was, it was a very interesting experience and, and a very gratifying experience. I did lose patients who were like, well, you're, I can't believe you're doing this to me. You're bit. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you know, I'm still here for you no matter what, like to address all of your other healthcare needs. So it's, it's difficult. And like Dr. Sora said, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it's, it's an evolution. So I think going off of that, that it doesn't happen overnight. Um, that I think for most of the physicians here, healthcare providers that you learned about this out of after school, <clears throat> that for us in school right now, still saying, you know, at least being taught larks are the best thing to prescribe first off. How do we incorporate this in going out into my clinical rotations next year? Like, do I, I still think it's, at least for me right now, it is an option. And if we're going to argue, I don't know, that I don't think it can be all or none for us. But it's an option that we should include when we have those conversations with our parents, uh, our patients. That if you're gonna pers if you're gonna give them the options for, you know, the larks, the, any other birth control, um, I don't know what else. George, or I guess what Georgetown might still offer. Um, I don't know the details on that, but that this is one of those things to offer. So how do we, I guess, grow and how do we how do we get the word out that it's to the rest of the world that we can't say it's all or none, but that it should be an option that we're aware of. Well, I think first of all, you you work on your not your own knowledge base, so. You can do that on the internet, you can do it by books, you can do it by a whole bunch of literature. You go to the Marquette Model website, I think Dr. Faring has all of the all the NSP literature on there, so you can do a lot of self-learning. And then find out who's closest to you who's a teacher, you have their pamphlets, so you can give those out. I mean, that's just two basic ways to start, you know. And then you have come back, people come back and show you their charts, and you go, hmm, <laughs> we need to go further with this. But that's where, that's where to start. Get, get some basic knowledge base for yourself. Get some referrals that you can give. So then when your, pro, your um, clinician, your supervisor in the clinic says, you know, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm, why didn't you prescribe the pill for this person? Well, I told them about NFP, and here's where I sent them. So again, it's reality. Do you have something concrete to offer and if you do, that makes all the difference. It takes time, but I think what you're doing here, Margaret, oh, is, yeah, is absolutely. tremendous, making inroads, having these conversations with students, and um, having people just fight a good fight and just spreading the word out. It's um, keep doing what we're doing, and um, it's it's great that you guys are hearing this and that's this school, and that's what you that, you know that's the other thing. Right? And what, what Dr. Lugo alluded to earlier, like if you can come in with a skill set, I mean, Colleen can teach these methods. I mean, that's going to make her an asset when she's doing clinical rotations because when you see the umpteenth patient for that vaginal discharge, she's going to be able to like sit down and maybe help distinguish is this really an infection or is this just her normal recurrent vaginal or cervical fluid secretions that she just didn't realize was a normal part of her process. So, you know, becoming trained to teach any one of these methods, you know, would be a huge yeah. um, advantage because that gives you a skill set, you know, that, that you can share with patients, that you can be as serve as a resource for the um, clinicians that you may be that you may be working with. I also think each one of us needs to give ourselves individual permission to go through our own journey. Mm -hmm. My journey was completely different from everybody else who has um, talked about their journey. 
and these experiences are very um, intimate and very personal and what motivates one person to learn NFP is not the same thing that motivates another one. What motivates, motivates one person to stop prescribing contraceptives may be different from, from what um, motivates the next person. Um, and each one of us needs to give ourselves permission to go through our journey. It's good to share the experiences. Some of the things that help, helped me might help you. But in, in, ultimately, um, each one of us has a different journey in, in our professional life, and our personal lives, and uh, we just need to be aware of that. If, if you take a, your own path, that's the way you're supposed to go. Um, you know, ask for help, ask for support. But don't feel bad if you didn't do what I did or what somebody else did. Each one of us has to um, drone. <laughs> the other thing I would mention is uh, <clears throat> you're asking how can you begin to incorporate some of these elements into your rotations when you are residents. And I would say a lot of what motivates different departments to become open mm -hmm. to to meeting certain needs comes from patients, actually. Mm -hmm. So starting with asking your patients, oh, are you using any apps to track your menstrual cycle? There are over 100 apps out yeah. there. People are using these left, right, up, down, don't know really what they're doing with them, and you can become, you can start to gather some of that data and just asking that question in your encounters. Are you using something now? Oh, well, what information are you putting into it? Oh, just your period? Have you ever looked at any other signs? Are you aware of any of those things? Are you interested in learning about how you can identify how your hormones are balanced or not balanced? When you're, do you know when you're ovulating? And people really like to have that conversation. A lot of women have ideas about when they think they're ovulating. Mm -hmm. And they, they have never been asked that before. And they've never had a doctor who is interested in what they are already tracking. And so as soon as there is some patient demand, then we try to meet those needs. We're very interested in patient satisfaction these days. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's another avenue that you can tap into. I think two important follow-ups to what Dr. White just said. The apps issue is real. Mm -hmm. Women are using these apps. And as she said, there's over 100 of them out there. Dr. White um, and I and a couple of our fax colleagues actually did a review of all of these apps. Most of them are not based on evidence-based methods of fertility awareness that you're learning. Some of them are really glorified calendar calculation apps. They may ask women to enter their temperature and their mucus, but then they don't use those observations at all. So of the apps that are out there, there were about 10 that we would recommend. So I will make sure to send you a link to the, the, the summary of that apps review, which shows of the 100, we only ended up rating 40 because some of them had disclaimers do not use if you're using it to avoid pregnancy. <laughs> well, that's fine if it's somebody that just wants to track their period, but if it's if it's being perceived, well, that that's a problem. So we, we excluded those and we excluded those that were not based on evidence-based methods. So I will send that to you. The other thing with regards to student um, and patient interest, I mentioned earlier, you know, I have students that have worked with me on their ISP project. I'm currently working with two students from the University of Minnesota. Um, one of the students for her OB module, like, had to do, like, a brief survey presentation about something. So she decided to post on her Facebook page, like, a few questions, like, two women saying, like, do you use a natural method of family planning? Have you talked with your doctor about it? What has been your experience? Would you refer patients to your doctor? She had to shut the survey down in 30 hours because she had over 300 responses. Wow. She was inundated by women who had a lot to say <laughs> about their experiences talking wow. about natural methods of family planning with their doctors. And suffice it to say, it wasn't very positive. <laughs> you know, a lot of women felt very um, put off and dismissed. Patients who were doctors themselves felt completely insulted by their colleagues who would mock them for choosing to chart their cycle. Um, and so um, there are, people are using these methods, you know. It's just we're not, and what happens is what they would say is like, I won't ever talk to my doctor about it again. So then they just, they either stop seeing that doctor or they don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not going to help you provide good health care. So um, if any of you guys are interested, you know, for your ISP project and getting involved in some of the research, let me know, um, you know, because we're, I'm always happy to get more students involved in, in doing research around this, around this topic. But, um, and studies have shown that when women are told about these methods, up to 60% would be interested in learning more. They just don't know about it. And why? Like Dr. Soros said, 
you guys are going to be far more knowledgeable than many of the OB attendings and residents that you're going to work with. The research shows only 3 to 6% of physicians are familiar, OB and family physicians are familiar and knowledgeable with fertility awareness based methods. That's unheard of. And the other reason, can you speak to the CDC? Yeah, so the other reason, and I'm sure you've seen this and heard this, um, what happens is uh, in terms of effectiveness rates, right? Everyone's like, well, I'm not going to recommend natural methods because they're ineffective. The CDC quotes a 24% failure rate for these methods. That statistic is based on the National Survey for Family Growth and Research that was done in 1995 and in 2002, and I think I mentioned this to this group, where they surveyed all these women, right? And they lumped them all together. So it doesn't give the individual effectiveness rates for the Sintel Thermal Method, for the Marquette Method. But that's the one rate that the CDC quotes, and so like that's two what, years later. yeah, and that's what many yeah. doctors go back mm -hmm. and quote. And so one of the things that FACS is doing is we're working with another organization, Natural Womanhood. We're going to be launching a petition next week. We want to try and get thousands and thousands of signatures asking the CDC to update their data based on <laughs> prospective cohort trials, not yeah. retrospective yeah. surveys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I've spoken to colleagues before, a lot of the pushback I get, well, you know, that that's great, but that symptom thermal study was done in Germany. Or, you know, that billing study was done in India. Right, because women in Germany have a different reproductive physiology than women in the U.S. If it's the issue of, like, <laughs> these studies aren't being done in the U.S., then do the studies in the U.S. Put the funding there so that we can do the research. Now, with all these women tracking apps, you could easily do this study. But we need money, right? We need the money for the research. So we'll, we're going to be launching that petition. Um, and I would certainly ask you, encourage you to share it with your friends, like on Facebook and social media. And, you know, because if we can get more people, you know, they're just... We need to show that there is a demand for this up-to-date information. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we cannot oversell these methods. I mean, we can't say, like, yeah, these methods are great for the one that's got many sexual partners and, you know, a history of STDs and say, like, I still think, yes, is it worth women learning how to chart their cycles? Absolutely. Is it the best method for them? Probably not. But we shouldn't be the one to paternalistically judge and say, well, I'm not going to tell them about natural mm -hmm. methods because maybe they will mm -hmm. change their mind. You know, I think we just need to include it among all of the options that we make available um, make available to patients. So, I just wanted to make a comment. I um, thought what Dr. Sora said about um, how she felt like it opened up conversation more. And like at first, I didn't realize it, but then I was thinking back personally. Like when I asked my uh, physician for birth control, they asked me one do you want one that you'll get a period with? And then they said, <laughs> be safe. And then like we were on to the next part of our talk. So I thought it was like really great that she was like, well, then I, you know, tell them, well, maybe you shouldn't. And I mean, I wasn't young when I, I asked and like I was college age, but I just, that, I never thought of that before until she said, well, you know, like, we need to talk to them about, you know, like why and not just say, okay, we'll be safe. But it's something that I never really noticed. I was just going to add it again, the point that you don't know how someone's going to receive the information, so you can't make that assumption that the, the high-risk sexually active woman is not going to want to know about that information. You just don't know how, who you're going to affect. So before I... Um, before I made the change in my personal life, you know, before I met, even met Kathy to, to teach me the, the Creighton model, um, I heard about, I was introduced to this, you know, this whole new world by you, by um, Dr. Sora, who, was, who came to speak at our, at my, at our parish. It was just, that's how I was introduced to her. And she was just speaking about these methods. And, um, and I, having been I'm married and ha have children and seeing what she was advertising or selling, it was, it was, yes, she went over, it's not just about the not giving them something that's risky to their health, but it's why this could make your relationship so much better and so much more fulfilling. And, and I thought, well, I want that. You know, I want that. I mean, I'm not, I wasn't miserable on contraception. There were things I didn't like about it, but I wasn't miserable. It was more that I wanted what I thought it could also bring besides being healthier, but maybe, uh, you know, and, and I've experienced that in my marriage and I never had a bad marriage before, but it, <laughs> even better and even more spiritually uh, fulfilling and a different type of intimacy than 
what we had when I was contracepting. And I would say the same thing. And it was not a quick, easy sell for him <laughs> as it was for me because I was like, I'm done, cold turkey. You know, I'm, I want this done. And it took some more convincing, but he, um, he would not... Um, it's, it was an amazing gift, and it, you never—it was one person who led me to another person, who led me to a whole organization. I would never be here today, you know, um, had I not been, you know. And I just feel like my, you know, not only personal life has been um, enhanced, but my my professional life definitely too, because now I, including this, um, and not depriving women of this information. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, t I think I told you guys like it was. I was on call on OB call one night, and one resident told me about this. Mm -hmm. And we still joke because she doesn't remember that conversation. Oh. And I'm like, do you realize like what you created? Because <laughs> that night, I mean, I didn't realize at the time how that was going to change my career, but it has completely changed my career. And I'm still very good friends with her. Um, and uh, she's like one of the most quietest, soft spoken, like, I now have her trained as a fact speaker, but she was like, I would never do this. I had her testifying for the American Academy of Family Physicians about why she'd be like, she's like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm like, well, it's all your fault. So <laughs> but you never know. I mean, you may be having a conversation with one of your friends about like, oh, you know, we talking to this doctor who said like, you know, we were commenting about, you know, the, the comment that Dr. Sora made about, you know, I want to share more, you know, about all of this. Like, you never know how it's going to impact other people around you. Um, so... So, yeah, I think that's a great point. I do want to highlight, I'm hoping, I know we're going to have at least one guy there next week on the panel, which will be great. <laughs> I'm hoping to have more um, because, I, again, I think it, as much as there are benefits to these methods, there are challenges. I had a 45-minute conversation outside my son's baseball practice last night with another mom, another woman who uses NFP, and she was just saying how her husband's, like, beside himself because she ended up having a double peak this month, and he's like, are you kidding me? We have to wait longer? Like, he was just going, and, and she's like, what do I tell him? I'm like, she's like, I'm like, well, you're under any stress? She's like, yeah, my mother-in-law was here last week for Easter. I'm like, well, yeah, tell him it was his fault, but his mother-in-law came for Easter. But, I mean, it's, it's hard for the men, you know? I mean, it's hard for the women, too. It's not just, but, but, so, so it is, there are benefits, there are challenges, you know, just like anything that's good for you health wise. You know, I'm doing girls in the room with my eight year old and she's running circles around me as I'm like, oh my God, I'm dying. But I'm thinking, this is good for me. Like the fact that I've got a cramp, I just need to get over this. The fact that my ego is shot by the fact that my eight year old is like running laps around me. I'm like, I'm going to get past this because there, there are benefits to it. You know, there are challenges. I'm not going to lie and say, I love running. So they do not. And then times that I like don't love tracking my cycle. I'm like, oh. but. But there's one of the little benefits to add on to that. One that I was not expecting because I'm way over uh, to menopause. But because we established, I used the sympathetic method for 23 years, my husband and I, of our marriage. And now that I'm past the, the years of menopause, because we were able to have the conversations and really talk about stuff that was so personal. We had, we established this great trusting relationship. So now it's like we talk about stuff. It, it follows you into the next le uh, stage of your life. So it's, it's a win-win. It really is. So. That reminds me of something that one of you that were charting um, commented on in your chart. In, uh, and I think a couple of you made this comment about how the neat thing that you've discovered so far is how it's just made you more aware of your body. And when I read that, I thought to myself, that is so true. And for me, what I found is it not only made me aware of my body in terms of like my fertility, like, you know, obviously like you're taught to tune into your body, but I found when I had children, it made me so much more aware of them. And so with the breastfeeding, I found breastfeeding to be so much easier because I, I had been training myself to tune in, like to tune into those, you know, nonverbal forms of communication, the way your body is speaking to you. And when I had a baby, like the way my baby was speaking to me. So I found, I found that whole bonding and breastfeeding relationship. And I remember thinking about it one day as I was nursing her, I'm like, I get this because I've been conditioned mm -hmm. really to pay attention, mm -hmm. you know, and it was, it was amazing to me how that transferred, you know, like it's, it's all linked to your fertility. I mean, like from before pregnancy to, you know, it just, it made me much more aware, um, which I thought was fascinating.